Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name is Leo Hickman and I edit the website Carbon Brief and welcome to um, our second webinar. It really is wonderful that so many people around the world have registered to watch. Um, so thank you for taking the time to join us um, today. And today's topic for discussion is the following. Is climate change making wildfires worse? And we have the perfect panel here today. Everyone you can see on the screen alongside me has researched this issue as well as having in-field experience. And also joining to me today is our moderator, um, is my colleague Daisy Dunn, Carbon Brief Science Writer. You hopefully will have seen on our website last week the in-depth explainer that Daisy wrote about this topic. So the format for today is that Daisy will chair the discussion with the panelists before we then widen it out to some of the questions you've been sending in to us already. You also have the opportunity to pose a question via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. And please note not to use the chat box. Your questions for the panelists must be left in the Q&A box. Okay, so let's start. So over to you, Daisy. Thanks, Leo. Okay, so our first panelist today is Dr. Freddie Otto who is the Acting Director at the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford. So Freddie, earlier this year you were part of a team of scientists who looked into the influence of climate change on Australia's bushfires in the 2019-2020 season. Can you tell us a bit more about the results of that analysis and how they compare to the global picture? I, uh, I'll give it a try, yeah. So um, I think the overarching question of this webinar is the influence on climate change on wildfire, but um, I will only talk about the meteorological component of a wildfire because of course a fire is not something that is directly, that, that is only dependent on the weather and the climate, but there are all sorts of other important components and I'm pretty sure that the other panelists will talk about that. So when we from, as, as climate scientists, ask the question, what is the role of climate change in these wildfires? Um, then the question that we are asking is, uh, what is the role of climate change in the meteorological component of fire? So in the underlying meteorological conditions that then if there is fuel uh, available um, and, and ignition can, can lead to fire. And so, um, and uh, what these conditions are is not exactly the same everywhere in the world, but it's uh, a combination of high temperatures, it's uh, wind speeds, um, and uh, and the the absence of of water, so um, so dry dry conditions and also the humidity. Um, but exactly how these different components play out is is really dependent on where in the world. Um, we are. And so in the case of the Australia study, so the first question you ask is, okay, there are, it, there are fires burning in Australia, but which is, um, which is the right way of looking at, at, the, uh, at the meteorological hazard of it? And so and there are different indices that combine these meteorological variables to, to, um, to, to show how uh, what what the fire risk or the fire hazard in that region is, and so in the case of um, the uh, the study in Australia, we actually used the Canadian Fire Weather Index because um, working together with the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia, um, we found that that compares best with the area actually burned in in these fires. So we choose we have chosen that index, and that um, and then we have looked at observations of um, of the different variables that you, we then use to compute this index and also um, many uh, different climate models where we looked at the different meteorological components, so temperature, um, absence of rainfall, wind and so on and computed, um, and computed this index. And uh, we then asked what is the likelihood of a fire hazard like the one observed or worse in the world we live in today. And then we compare that to what's the likelihood of um, this fire hazard of, an, in, um, of a value as we have observed it this, this season or worse in the world that might have been without anthropogenic climate change. And because we know very well how many greenhouse gases have been emitted since um, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, um, we can remove these from the climate models and so simulate a counterfactual world. 
And by doing this, we found that in the case of the Australian bushfires, um, climate change made them at least 30% more likely to occur. And then we also looked into which of these indices were actually, or with which of these components of the index were actually most affected. And you can see a very strong signal in, um, in the, uh, in the um, temperature part of this fire index. Um, and, but you don't see, for example, any changes in the likelihood of the drought component in that index. Um, so in this case, most of the results that we have seen were driven by the sharp increase in the temperature. And now um, here is just, um, just a very brief, brief slide to show that this is obviously Australia. And you can see in, uh, in these yellow and red, this is where um, the severity of the bushfires in that season. Um, and in sort of bluish, you can see where there are forests because before we actually look at what index to use or anything, we need to decide, well, where actually, what is the right time frame and what is the right geographical scale to look at these fires? Because um, it could be that a, a fire season is very short and very localized, or here you can see that actually there are two parts of Australia where there were lots of fires and we decided to focus on the eastern part because that's where most people live and so where the impacts on the population are actually um, largest. But if we had looked at, at a different region and a diff different time scale, the actual magnitude of the result of our study would, would likely be different. It's, it's because it, it really matters um, how, how exactly you define the, the aspect of fire that you can look into with meteorological data and, and climate models. And I think I'll leave it at that. Okay, Freddie, thanks for that. Um, so the second panelist is Dr. Anne Alencar, who is the Director of Science at the Amazon Environmental Research Institute in Brazil. So Anne, can you please tell us a bit more about recent wildfire trends in Brazil and to what extent we see climate change playing a role in these fires versus other factors? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, it's, it's very important to understand that wildfires are very rare in the Amazon forest. Uh, uh, different from California or from Australia, uh, there they have wildfires, bushfires. Our fires are mostly driven by uh, anthropogenic ignition, direct anthropogenic ignition, which are basically related to deforestation process. So, and, and this is very, very, very important to, to understand because all the ignition sources that we have in the Amazon are man-made. Um, so, and how that relates with, uh, with um, uh, climate change? Well, if we have an average year, like humid year, uh, and our dry season, which is basically the fire season, is going to be, um, so the amount of fire that we have is going to be a reflex of how much fire people set. Uh, so if we have more deforestation, we have more fires, and maybe we also have more management fires, which are fires that people use to clean pastures, we call clean pastures, or uh, to uh, clean pasture from weeds and things like that. Uh, but if we have a very dry year, which is caused by uh, some of the climatic phenomena, uh, such as El Nino or AMO, which, uh, which is the uh, Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, or um, the North Atlantic Oscillation, which are the, I mean, the, main, the main climatic events that have some effect on, on the dryness of the Amazon forest. So during these years, yes, uh, we can have more uh, forest fires because we change that condition of the forest, of the rainforest, uh, to act as a barrier for fires. Um, even though, even in these years, if uh, the, the climate is very dry and if we don't have, if we change the condition of the fuel material, but if you don't have the ignition source, we won't have a fire because there's no natural fires in the Amazon. So, um, and this takes us to 
to the point that controlling forest fire, oh, controlling deforestation fires is, is the key issue that we have to do in the Amazon to control uh, widespread uh, forest fires. I don't know if you want me to talk more about it, but... Uh, mm. um, no, that's great, unless you have anything else you want to add now, or we can come back to this topic a bit later on. No, I think it's only this. And this year, I mean, no, this takes us to last year, maybe, and this year. What happened last year? We had um, average year uh, for the Amazon. We know that in the southern part of South America and in the other parts of the world, in Australia, uh, that, that Dr. Freddie uh, has uh, talked about, uh, but in, for the Amazon, we have actually actually a very average rainfall and dryness year. Um, so that uh, takes uh, le leads us to understand that uh, actually the fires that we have seen uh, that shocked the world were all like deforestation fires or pasture fires. We had some forest fires because we had more ignition and also there's another aspect to that. If the forest is very degraded by logging, like selective logging, uh, or very fragmented by a lot of deforestation, so the edge of the forest loses it, its ability to hold fire a bit. So you can have a little bit of, of wildfires there or of forest fires there because you change that uh, uh, relationship between the condition of the fuel material, uh, the availability of the fuel material, the climate uh, condition, and also the ignition sources. So the, those are the three major elements that takes uh, the Amazon forest to, to burn. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the next panelist we have today is Dr. Frank Lake, who is a fire ecologist of indigenous American Indian descent from the United States Forest Service based in California. So Frank, from the perspective of yourself and the communities you've worked with, can you describe how wildfires have changed in the US, particularly in California? And to what extent can we say that climate change is playing a role in these fires versus other factors, including human land use and things we've heard about so far? Yeah, so I want, can you, I want to think about California as being a very diverse climatic region, uh, primarily Mediterranean type climate, cool, moist winters, warmer, hot, dry summers. And that's been the climatic norm for, for hundreds of years. But within that, there's the variation. And also for California, it's a very linguistically, historically, very linguistically and tribally diverse community of indigenous people. And with that, very diversified fire regimes and the notion that I'd like to talk about is the development of the cultural fire regime. And so, yes, um, we've seen here more recently trends of warming, drying, extending the fire season, more climatically induced fire behavior, but there's factors that contribute to that that I really think need to be kind of unpacked and understood, particularly for different ecosystems across California that are fire prone ecosystems um, that were heavily influenced by indigenous people prior to colonization by Spanish and Americans. And with that, um, referencing anywhere from Southern California Chaparral up to the far Northern Conifer Mixed Hardwood Forest of Northern California and from the coastal headlands to the interior higher subalpine environments, there is a gradient there of high probability of lightened ignitions um, historically. But with that, there's also um, based on archeological and other anthropological evidence, very high densities of indigenous people that were using fire across the landscape. Well, that diversified fire use by indigenous people that modified the frequency, the seasonality, the specificity, and particularly the way they wanted to manipulate the potential vegetation often tended to nudge that towards or move that towards more drought tolerant, fire adapted vegetation species that were of cultural importance. Um, some of the work in looking at the effect of climate, I would say with, from Alan Taylor and Carl Skinner had a paper that came out in Pinas regarding the extent of fires and the climatic effect. And they were showing that prior to Spanish colonization in the 1700s and uh, then American settlement in the 1800s in California, at least it was a more anthropogenic or indigenous fire regime or cultural fire regime, regime system. And then with the 
colonization and settlement, there was the major decreases in indigenous populations through disease, genocide, forced removal, and then subsequently the Spanish had their first law enacted um, was to reduce our outlaw Indian burning. And then soon after that, the state of California and the United States with their fire suppression policies. What that did is besides the removal of quite significant diversified indigenous ignitions, you then had a whole different culture come in that then valued fire exclusion and fire suppression, really demonizing or seeing fire as something as deadly or catastrophic versus being a fire dependent culture from the indigenous perspective that viewed fire as medicine. And with such, there was a cultural or stewardship responsibility to use fire to augment lightning and to promote that more diversified system. So when we think about like the work of Alan Taylor and Carl Skinner and showing that the system moved from being primarily indigenous driven to then being more climate driven after colonization, that's when you begin to start to see uh, across many different fire scar records from the work done here for different chronologies, the increase in size of fires, the increase in patch size or size of those, but also in relation to being more narrowed into the lightning season. And then of course, with the colonization and exclusion of fire, we have now over 100 and 150 years of buildup of lots of fuels, mass amount of forest densification, and now with exacerbated parts of climate, warming, drying trends, increased human density, then we have factors that all lead to there being more extensive fires. And according to many indigenous communities that I've worked or looked at ethnographic research, conducted rural history interviews with, that there has been many larger, more extensive fires that otherwise could have been prevented. And that's the nature of my work is looking at the way in which indigenous knowledge can guide our fire research, but also understand fire effects. And looking at this perspective, um, this photo here, of the Salmon River in the Klamath Mountains. We see a range of uh, understory burn severities, but we also see the smoke. So we have this very diversified conifer and hardwood forest with the water. And for many of the indigenous teachings here amongst the Karuk and the Yurok and the other tribes is that relationship of lightning isn't producing the goods and services through moderating that fire regime, then it's your indigenous responsibility to step in there and to use fire to promote that. And particularly water is one of the most sacred attributes in this Mediterranean drought light climate. And so by maintaining perennial spring flow, reducing tree vegetation that are essentially straws, sucking up water that, um, that contribute to evapotranspiration, you use indicators. And I think I, that's an important part as a scientist when working with indigenous communities, we have our metrics that we measure, but what are the important metrics to that indigenous community? What are the indicators such in this case, that would be aquatic um, species in the water, such as the salamanders and the salmonids or the salmon that are cold water dependent species and linking the uphill or watershed fire effects to those aquatic species. And that's through those indigenous teachings and that really frames the nature of my, of my work here in California. So yes, we're seeing more extensive fires, but from many of the tribal perspectives, those are preventable by increasing the cultural fire regime and reinstating or revitalizing that indigenous fire stewardship. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, so our final panelist is Dr. Christina Santine, who is a wildfires researcher from Swansea University in Wales. Um, Christina, you studied changes to wildfires both in the UK and in other parts of Europe. Could you explain how climate change is having an effect on these wildfires? Yeah. Hello, everyone, and thanks, Carbon Brief, for inviting me to be here today. Let me just share my screen with you. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about the UK and then later on we can discuss more about the rest of uh, Central and Northern Europe, but I think many of the things can apply to the Atlantic Europe. Uh, I wanted to start with this picture because this is an important message and this is that fire here in Europe, in the UK, is a human issue. So we have seen like in Freddy and Frank, uh, there are other climates that are prone to fire, but we definitely not have uh, a climate or weather prone to fire. But we do have a lot of fires. Actually, the UK have around 30,000 fires every year, but most of these fires are really small and they 
basically burn grass or heathland, as, as we can see in this picture. So we don't have these super intense and catastrophic and dangerous uh, crown fires in forests. We don't have them yet. Um, just, just to show a couple of graphs, these are, I'm subtracting them from a report that uh, British universities together with the Forestry Commission at the Met Office, uh, we are writing in the mom, at the moment to inform the third uh, climate uh, change risk assessment of the UK. Um, these are re regarding trends or what, what has been going on with fires over the last decades. Uh, well, we can't really say much because we don't have a lot of historical data of fire because ha fire hasn't been seen as a big issue in these countries, in the UK and in other uh, North European countries. Uh, so you can see these are uh, annual area burned um, number of fires reported by EFIS. So this is done by MODI. So it's only picking up the fires bigger than 25, 30 hectares. Therefore, that's why we only have like a couple hundred of fires per year. Even if I say that we can have up to 30,000 fires, but again, most of them are really, really small. Um, so yeah, we can see that we had a couple of the last years, we, we had more fires, but of course we only have a temporal um, record of 10, 15 years, so we cannot say much about that. What we can say, however, um, and these are some predictions based on, as Freddie said, these are only based on climate, these were made by a uh, Matt um, um, Matt Perry from the Met Office for this same report that I mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier. So the UK is already feeling the effect of climate change. So we have an increase of uh, warm spells over the last decades or so. And if we go into the future, we'll see that the fire weather index, again, this is the Canadian fire weather index that Freddie mentioned. So we see that the numbers of days during the year where we can have, we can expect a higher fire risk in, in, in terms of weather increase in the next uh, few decades. However, I would just like to end with this uh, slide that I really like because we cannot, whatever we are seeing and whatever we we'll see, we cannot only blame it to climate change, not especially in Europe because the, the fire is going to be a result of the interaction of weather, of human ignitions. I, I forgot to mention that here, all practically all our ignitions are human, either by, by accidental causes or by arson. So how is going to change these ignitions and very, very importantly, how our land uses are going to change or are changing because that's, only going, that's also going to affect the fuel availability and the, and the uh, spatial distribution of fuel. So not only climate change. So I think I will stop here now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, it was very interesting to hear from people who have expertise in different parts of the world, but there's some common themes emerging to do with how human influence in terms of deforestation and things like that kind of overlap with climatic changes. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna pass it over to answer some of your questions. I can see that already quite a few questions were coming in. So Leo, I think you're gonna start us off with the first question from an audience member. Um, yes, thanks Daisy and thanks to all the panellists. Yeah, we've had some fantastic questions pinging in. In fact, it's quite hard to, to choose between them at the moment. But why don't we start with this one, which has been directed at Freddie by Dr. Will Howard, who's a climate scientist at, um, working with the Australian government. And Will is asking, how close are our Earth system modelling capabilities to being able to incorporate factors such as fuel quantity and conditions into the modelling approach utilised in the Australian bushfire attribution study? Um, that's a good question. Uh, and I think, um, so what, what the models definitely incorporate and can incorporate is the type of, of land that, that, that is available. Um, so, so whether it's forest and what kind of forest, but of course, um, not not exactly uh, the amount of fuel in a given year. Um, but I think um, what uh, what we have seen in in these studies that that we've done in Australia uh, is that the models are actually um, 
really underestimating the effect uh, of uh, or the the increase in temperature in these smaller localized areas where where fires start. So I think um, that that indicates that all the estimates that we have in terms of uh, in terms of the the increase in uh, in fire weather from a climate change point of view are really conservative estimates. So um, and I think uh, improving models to to get the climate feedbacks right is a, probably a more uh, a more important research question before um, be, be, because I think that that the fuel availability and and other aspects like that that is conceivably that you can do that with not within the same model but sort of as as an additional step. Okay, thank you, Freddie. Um, Daisy, have you got um, um, another question? Yeah, so I've got a question from Mary Huffman, who is a director of Indigenous Peoples Burning Network and Fire Science at the Nature Conservancy. So this is two questions kind of wrapped into one. What is the role of Indigenous people in bringing wildfires back into balance? And what is Indigenous fire stewardship and how can non-Indigenous people support it? So Frank, I know you've already spoken a bit about this, but would you mind taking this question? Thank you. Yeah, so in a, a contemporary context, I think it's important to acknowledge in, uh, indigenous or in our case, California tribal sovereignty as being part of the governance structure when it comes to incident management teams for managing wildfire. And here in the US, we have the National Cohesive Strategy for Wildland Fire that has three components, such as resilient landscapes, fire adapted communities, or what I'd say fire dependent cultures, and safe and efficient wildfire response. And in that context, linking policy and governance down to operational aspects on the ground and working with indigenous people is a way to acknowledge one, their, their role and place in that fire prone ecosystem as a fire dependent culture. And that links back to the indigenous fire stewardship, which I'll talk more about. But in that construct today, and I'd also might add in my work as a um, federal scientist, but also as a resource advisor, often serving as a lead resource advisor on large fires here, working with uh, incident management teams over the last probably 15 years. Um, this structure of having government, government agreements with indigenous communities um, have designated tribal representatives that engage that work with incident command team and a strategic management of those fires. We also talk about wildfire management being having a, we call incident action plans, having objectives of that day. And many of those objectives in this area, because of the larger population of indigenous or tribal people, often reflect natural cultural resources as well as fire, fire personnel, and public safety. And so in that opera, 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 operationally, including indigenous people into that wildfire planning, but also as well as um, managing wildfires to achieve your resource objectives, that's one way of bringing in that indigenous fire stewardship. Um, it's a model that I've tried to ex have other indigenous communities, whether it's in Australia, um, other places to be aware of. Um, again, back to this kind of colonial fire management model system, the US incident command teams has had that model really brought all over the world. I know like when we had large fires here, Australians came here, incident management teams, uh, likewise, our fire service went over there to support them these past year in the brush service. But what I didn't hear was the opportunity to engage those Aboriginal or Indigenous communities more directly like we have here in Northern California. So that's a government-to-government -government agreement process that brings them into that management. But on the pro side of fire risk reduction and hazardous mitigation and working in uh, around communities is that Indigenous fire stewardship often trying to achieve again here promoting those drought tolerant fire adapted species that then allow the ability to manage fire either on your terms um, at less climatically uh, volatile or severe conditions, um, diversifying that seasonality. So burning actually different vegetation types in the cold dry periods of our winter, but also perhaps more extending that fall season. And then what that does on the proactive side of using prescribed burning or cultural burning is that reduces the fuel loading, reduces the risk of the future fire. And so we often think about deferred risk by suppressing fires right now um, actively to protect life and property, there's trade-offs. Um, and working with indigenous communities to think about 
the opportunity to manage fire, to achieve resource objectives, and to protect life and property, there's an opportunity to explore the ways in which that indigenous knowledge can inform the governance and the management of fires to achieve, again, a range of values that we want, but really also promoting in many areas of our fire dependent species and vegetation, reintroducing that fire for cultural and socio ecological objectives. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Frank. Um, so we have a question here directed to Anne, but I guess anyone can um, respond as well after Anne. But this is from um, Shigurio Watanabe Jr. And it, um, the question is, could you say something about the fires during the last strong El Nino event, which I think, Anne, you already touched upon, but were there more fires at that time and did they affect pristine forest areas? Um. Yeah, and the, the last El Nino that we had, it was a very strong one uh, and very long as well. I uh, started in the end of, of 2014 and ended in 2016, but we also faced a lot of fires in 2017. So uh, it's not what we, we have seen that when we have a, such a long climatic event that causes very extreme droughts during the dry season and also um, affects the recharge, I mean the, the wet season uh, consecutively. The next year, which was 2017, we have more fires in, a lot of fires in the Amazon and a lot of forest fires in the Amazon. Um, so even though we, our uh, deforestation rates were kind of increasing that time, but much lower than what we have now, uh, but the, the, a lot of areas were burned because we, we had this very strong event, uh, um, consecutive uh, dry season events caused by a very strong El Nino. Uh, and uh, so, so this is, this is uh, uh, one of the major impacts also of climate change because it, it is affecting the, the climatic phenomena uh, and uh, we, we tend to suffer with that. And I, I remember that uh, the people from NASA or UC Irvine put together, um, uh, how can I say, a predictive model to indicate the drought, how is going to be the dry and uh, the risk of fire in 2017, and they had predicted a lot of fires because of the the El Nino, and uh, in fact there we had a lot of fires, but 2017 we had more fires of all. So I think my message here is that the the year when we have the climatic event event is very important. But if we have consecutive climatic events, the following year, if we don't have, if we, even if we don't have El Nino uh, or other climatic events affecting the dryness of the Amazon, the recharge during the wet season uh, was not sufficient actually to, um, uh, how can I say, uh, the vegetation is, is under a very uh, stress, like hydric stress. So uh, we can have consecutive, um, how can I say, um, impact of this, these events. Thank you very much. Um, so now we've got a question from Graham Craig, who's a senior policy advisor at the Welsh Government. Um, he's asking, are there any studies or is there much research around that can tell us about the difference between wildfire risk in Wales and the wider UK under 1.5 degrees of warming and two degrees of warming. So Christina, I'd ask you to talk about that if you can. Yeah, well, that's a tricky question. South Wales, so I'm based in Swansea and in South Wales. That's where the, especially this spring, the highest number of fires uh, happened. We have a lot of fires and we have a lot of arson fires. So many of these fires are not accidental. So it's really, it's really complicated because again, yeah, we can try to pre predict how weather and fuel availability is going to increase with, with the trending uh, warming of the climate, but we don't know how society 
um, is going to interact with us with that climate change. So send it in another way. We have lots of ignitions. And as I said, we had 30,000 uh, per year. So, so yeah, 30,000 per year in the UK. We have around up to 10,000. Uh, we can have up around to 10,000 per year in, some, in South Wales sometimes. So um, if we have a warmer climate, we'll have more fuel available to burn. But then we don't have lightning. So all our uh, fires come from people. And in South Wales, most of them, or many of them, we don't really have figures, but uh, most of them come from arson. So how, yeah. So that's why I said earlier that it's really, really important to look at the social economic aspect of fire, especially here. Thank you. Thanks, Prasina. Um, so we have another question here from, it's come from Indonesia and it's from Zara Kaniawati. And um, the question is, almost each year in Indonesia, there is always um, fires that are happened or caused intentionally by some corporates and companies to free the land for their own profit, which causes terrible damage to the countryside. Does any, do any of the panelists have any research into this? And I, I suppose the question is, is asking, how do you separate out the separate causes of certain fires? So do any of you have any thoughts on, on this question around on this kind of separating out different con contributing factors? And maybe if anyone wants to speak particularly to the, to the situation in, in Indonesia. I can comment how we are trying to do that in Brazil and uh, okay. so uh, well first of all most of the fires I mean 100% of the fires are set by someone and they are set intentionally to uh, like get rid of of the 300 tons of biomass that is cut chopped down of forest and, and have to to be burned to become nutrients to the soil to, to set some pasture or agriculture fields. Um, so the second type of fire, so this is the first type of fire. The second type of fire is the fire that is set in areas that were already the forest in the past and became pasture fields or agriculture fields that need to be cleaned from weeds or things like that. So those are, those are the most common types of fire in the Amazon. The third type of fire is the forest fires that occur in a very specific conditions, very driven by climate, um, so climatic phenomena, and also um, they need ignition sources. And the, the major ignition sources are the two that I mentioned first, the deforestation fires and the management fires. So those are the two major uh, ignition sources for the forest fires when we have very dry years. So knowing that, we know, um, uh, I mean, by overlapping with satellite, uh, how can I say, maps of land use, land use maps, we know what is burning. We know if forest is burning, if it's a recent deforested area burned, or if it's a, a pasture fields that is burning. So this is one part. But the second part is to understand who is burning. And for that, we cross with, um, with tenure uh, data, land tenure data. So we know, for example, that um, half of the fires that we had in the Amazon last year and uh, half of deforestation that we had last year happened in public lands, in Brazilian public lands, due to land grabbing. So, uh, and the other half, a part happened in, in private properties, the other part happened in, in smallholder uh, settlements. And so by doing that, we know who is setting fires, where these fires is, are happening, and in which land cover is burning. So we have, to, we can understand the processes uh, and we understand how to fight those fires. And I, uh, just to finish, so if half of the fire 
is happening in public lands uh, done by people that want to grab public lands, like, like criminals uh, take Brazilian land for themselves, those are per se illegal. So, uh, so you have, you can, what to do for that? I mean, you have to go and have police force. Enforcement is going to fight that. Uh, the other part of fire, which is the management fires in already open areas or deforestation fires that can happen in private properties, uh, you have, we have to deal with incentives, positive incentives to reduce the use of fire. So those elements, um, can, those how can I, solutions can only be said and implemented if you know which types of fire are happening where. So I don't know if I ha helped, but this is what we're trying to do in the, in the Amazon. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from Brian McHugh. He's asking how will fires in the Arctic impacting the global picture? Freddie, I know you recently looked into how climate change is, could be influencing the heat. Not so, not the wildfires themselves, but the kind of the weather that can sometimes promote wildfires. Do you mind talking a bit about that analysis? Um, yeah, so I think um, there is, there's definitely a huge difference in the fires that we have in, in tropical rainforests than fires that we have in, uh, in, yeah, in, in more temperate regions or, or, even, uh, or even in the Arctic. And um, I think what we, what we very clearly see and, and, and very, very strongly in, in the Arctic region is that of all the weather components that are important for, for fire, climate change is a huge game changer in the temperature component. So and if, if everything else is staying equal, um, but we have this huge change in, in the extreme temperatures because of climate change, then of course that increases also the, the risk of fires. And we have seen that in, in countries like Sweden, for example, where, we, uh, where, where colleagues have done attribution studies on the fires there and where we, where, where we see that. Um, but um, I think that, that everything else being equal is of course not necessarily always the case and you have to take the other factors into account if you really want to predict uh, the, the fire burning. So for example, in the Arctic, because of the increasing temperatures, also the vegetation is changing. And so actually um, you have, um, and, and there is, uh, and, bec and, and you've seen uh, in recent years more more rainfall and more snowfall. So actually that, that, that is sort of dampening um, the, the, the fire risk a bit. It's not, it's, uh, it's, it's not, it's in terms of the magnitude of change. It's totally not outweighing the temperatures in, in the Arctic regions. But I think if, yeah, for, for, the, for the individual um, areas you, you want to manage or you want, you're interested in and you want to see, um, these these factors become increasingly important, whereas you can say in the in the broad picture we have this huge temperature signal, and that that definitely um, makes all the other signals much smaller in these more temperate regions. But um, but yeah, but but if that also is if if there are not other factors outside the climate system uh, or or in other drivers are that are really important for the area that that you care about or that that one wants to manage i think it's it's harder to say something with these very broad brush that yeah it will get worse okay i think um christina wants to come in yeah i just i just wanted to add to what freddie said uh I think the question was also about how fire is going to can affect a climate and I think it has been a lot of interest recently because of these the so-called zombie fires and the Arctic and also the boreal regions are really interesting and I would say scary in that way because their soils accumulate a lot of carbon. That carbon is very very old so some of it is in peatlands and we also have tropical peatlands but uh, in the northern peatlands this this carbon is protected from fire because those don't tend to burn a lot but if 
we see an increase in fire in boreal regions and Arctic regions, as we, we are seeing already, some of that carbon is going to go into the atmosphere and can contribute to the carbon, um, the, the climate change. Also, it's not only CO2, it's methane. Also, the fires have an influence in the thawing of the per permafrost. So, as Freddie said, it's super complex, it's super complex uh, system, but I think it's interesting to, to know also that they are really bad, if we can say, uh, regarding climate change. Okay, thank you, Christina. Um, we have a question here from Wisdom de Costa, which is possibly one for Frank to take on um, in the first instance, is what can we do to reduce the risk of for forest fires um, in different parts of the world? Well, um, I think part of the, to reduce the risk of the non-desired wildfires, we have at least the US model here again um, in California, is to look at areas where you've had fire excluded and look at the intervals that have been missed. So if we have a frequent, formerly frequent fire prone ecosystem that say burned every 10 years on average between lightning and, and indigenous ignitions that now hasn't seen fire in 100 years, then we've missed 10 cycles. And so part of that also has led to the densification of, of trees that increased the fuel loading both in the surface to the ladder and canopy fuels that now really are um, when it's extremely dry and desiccation and those fuels dry out and there's other factors that affect that fuel continuity, then we're gonna have those larger, more extensive fires. Now there is some debate about the best way to reintroduce fire. Um, I would say a lot of my government-based studies looks at looking at thinning the forest, so promoting um, aspects of fire resistant drought tolerant trees, so those are often the larger, in our case, would be some of the larger hardwoods, um, conifers that are more fire adapted in their um, life history traits, promoting uh, what we call also heterogeneity or diversity um, amongst those forest types or other grasslands and shrub systems. In many cases, there used to be much more formerly extensive grasslands, prairies and meadows that have now have actually increased in tree density um, because of the absence of fire. And so we think about also prioritizing those areas strategically to get that complex early seral habitat um, that adds a lot of other diversity in our understory plants and shrubs and communities in that way. Also, again, that factor of thinking about reducing evapotranspiration or the amount of tree density that's utilizing water um, that affects our perennial springs and streams and creeks and rivers. So in that regard, um, promoting those fire resistant tree species Look at opportunities to increase fire um, use by reintroducing it perhaps on what we call the shoulder seasons or areas that aren't the wildfire most hot and extreme times. And then with that, the maintenance. I think so many times in our collaboratives, we see government entities or state entities working with um, non-governmental organizations, or our, our case like the watershed or fire safe councils and tribal governments as a cooper as a collaborative, looking at broader landscape restoration across jurisdictions. Um, that's an important part of that is to work across what we call um, all lands, all hands. Uh, if you have one, say, private property or an adjacent public land that isn't being as actively managed to reduce the fuels, to reintroduce fire, then you have those adjacency factors. And really fire, especially these larger fires that are more climatically driven now with large wind events, in our case in California, um, you need to have effective treatments across the landscape and across jurisdictions. And part of that, you have to really work on what are your shared values? What are your strategies for looking at fire at different scales and an opportunity to reintroduce fire? And particularly in our case here, that's looking at areas that were heavily influenced by cultural fire regimes, as well as lightning, and then reinstating those types of diversified burning to reduce fuel continuity and reducing the fuel continuity, increasing a lot of that, again, heterogeneity or diversity or mosaics between recently formerly burned areas then you have those barriers to fire spread that then allow you to either suppress that fire when it's, when it's burning under severe conditions to threaten life and property um, and to protect public resources or to be able to manage that fire to achieve a range of objectives where fire is a necessary part of that environment, social, culturally, as well as ecologically. Is there anyone that would like to add to what Frank said to that question? Okay, um, so moving on then, we've got a question from Alejandro Fernandez. 
and he's asking have paleo proxy methods um, informed our understanding of what fires are like today I think Frank you'll probably be able to answer that question as well and maybe other panelists yeah, I think we have to look at the availability of the science methodologies we have. So in the more physical science, we have the paleoclimate studies that often look at uh, lake or pond uh, cores of looking at the chronology there that articulates the amount of charcoal that is a metric for fire uh, episodes, as well as the pollen assemblage, which would represent those species that are more, say, fire tolerant or intolerant, that also represent dry and cool periods. So we can use that, but often at resolution in the lake um, cores are not very, like at the scale, the more decadal, and they can't really get down to year precision uh, chronology. So you see broader trends across decades with even the finer amount of paleoclimate looking at that pollen and charcoal assemblage across um, elevations, areas, this aren't you know high elevation lakes, but even lower elevations were possible. So you get a broader landscape signature of the trend climatically as well as fire episodes in the area. And then you cross-link that to the dendrochronology of the tree records. Often in our case, we have pines or cedars that are going back several hundreds of years, sometimes almost five or 600 years for those longer lived species. And when you chronology that, you can see the effect of fire there, both in seasonality um, by the ring scar boundary, but also in the frequency of fires that burned in that area. And that helps guide partly what was that occurrence of fire. Now the specificity um, is harder and to say, well, is that a lightning ignition or was that an indigenous ignition? We then use uh, multiple methods, interdisciplinary methods, um, looking at archeological information, oral history reviews, talking to elders, tribal indigenous people there to say, you know, what were the areas of the landscape that you more frequently would use with fire um, and have more specific of your own cultural objectives versus maybe the high probability of lightning and certain aspects of higher elevations or during a certain season. So that's the one way we can kind of disentangle that. Um, and I'd say now using those more inter interdisciplinary methods, we're able to kind of disentangle the anthropogenic versus the natural contribution of ignitions. And that also helps guide perhaps where we need to more actively use fire or reintroduce fire kind of on that cultural versus ecological justification. Okay, thanks Frank. Um, <clears throat> we have a great question here actually from, um, I'm gonna, uh, even pretend to pronounce his name correctly, uh, Avilo Hyberov, um, who has asked a question which is, to, just to paraphrase it slightly, if countries try to expand forests and bioenergy crops as part of their own climate mitigation strategies, could this put even larger areas of land at risk of fires? Does anyone want to take that on? Yeah, this is Frank. So we have a case here where there's the, um, the carbon offsets and the, and the funding that says, you know, if you, if you, grow if you can grow denser forests and sequester carbon, then you'll be able to have monetary offset for that, for essentially having those forest reserves. The trend we see here in more temperate forests is what is the expected vulnerability or risk to that forest over that 100-year life cycle? So in our case, we have Douglas fir, fast-growing conifer, um, that often is an important timber species tree. If we're now growing that not for timber or board feet, but we're growing it to sequester carbon, it can be on highly productive soils and, ground, and, and areas of the landscape that you're managing as that reserve. But then now because of the density and the homogenization or the single species that you're growing, it's now predisposed to drought stress from extended climate warming. It's now um, higher fire risk. And so you actually have a less resilient but maybe more carbon rich storage part of your landscape in that forest condition. But I would say in many cases, we might wanna diversify that and perhaps sequester a little bit less carbon, but still having a higher rate, but increase the resilience and the resistance of that area to help mitigate or prevent the effect of drought, fire risk and insect and disease on that stand. Because again, over that 100 year life cycle, you may be able to sequester so much carbon but it's also highly vulnerable. And if you get to your 80th year and it all burns up, then we've highly volatilized and just lost all that investment. Okay, I think, I think Christina, you had your hand up, I think I saw. Yeah, sorry, I went for the traditional <laughs> way. But no, I completely agree with Frank, as in, in the UK there is a lot of talking about rewilding now, 
And I'm not going to get into that discussion, but of course we need to be very careful of, with the type of trees we want to have. So any native, at, at least here, any native broadleaf tree is not very fire prone and those areas will be not very fire risk under the current and in the next couple of decades, but whatever conifer uh, plantation we have, we need, as Frank said, uh, when we are putting all the socioeconomic factors together, we need to have uh, into account that they can get riskier and riskier regarding fire in, in this trending of, in this trend of a, a warming climate. Thank you. Okay, so we've got a question from Karen Cofield. She's asking, in future climate projections examining fire frequency and intensity, are there estimates of the carbon emission feedbacks that can be attributed to these increases or decreases? So it's a question around to what extent can wildfires cause or drive a positive feedback for climate change? Um, is there any panelists that would like to answer this question? Can I try or at least start? Um, oh. Well, in, in, in the Amazon, as I said before, I mean, fire is not, is a, very, is a rare, like forest fires are, are rare events. So in the forest is not, um, the forest, the trees are not resistant to fires, like the bark is very thin and things like that. And the fire, the understory fires that they go very even they are not intense they are uh they are like this this big usually and they go into into the forest and they burn slow so they kill the trees uh some research uh, from the people from my lancaster uh led by joss barlow they have indicated that after uh, you still after 10 years of a fire event you still have like the forest is still emitting uh, carbon from the mortality of the trees done by, by these, um, these fires. And uh, some of the regions, some of the areas that we measured, like the impacts of, of one, one, two or three fires, um, uh, we had up to 50% less biomass uh, in, in the extended in forest. So the, it's a major impact on the Amazon forest that has not been accounted in our um, emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions accountability. Uh, and uh, we are putting together a set of scientists to do that. Uh, um, and uh, I think we, we will have, a, we'll be very surprised on the effects of uh, these rare events uh, on, on emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, thank you. I think we've, we've only got a couple minutes left, so let's try and squeeze in one question if we can. Um, so this question is from Caroline Koch, who is asking, um, even if the causes of the ignition of the fires can be attributed to humans and not blamed on climate change per se. Is it possible that fire weather conditions are changing and are favoring the spread of wildfires once ignited? And it kind of leads on to a, a wider question that a few people have asked is, can we tell um, what the proportion of fires ignited by people compared to say lightning are? Um, people are kind of quite intrigued about this, the way that we can actually attribute these different factors. I don't know if anyone, want, we've only got literally sort of a minute or so left, if anyone wants to take that on. Yeah, here in the US, we have um, using satellite imagery and other de fire detection, you can see where lightning strikes are for the positive, positive strikes. And then you can compare that lightning strike density um, data set from that imagery to then where there's the anthropogenic ignition. So that's one way to disentangle those. Uh, the other thing is then to look at the seasonality or when those are fires occurring or what part of the landscape under different meteorolo meteorological conditions. But to that effect, we are seeing an amplification of the foam or the dry east winds that are driving fire behavior here, particularly from California. And that is problematic in the sense that if there's fuel there, it will burn. And if it's hotter, drier, and more intense winds, then we're gonna have severe um, effects 
after high intensity fire. So we can likely disentangle what type of ignition, but where that occurs and how it occurs is often wind driven and those are becoming more extreme. Okay, thank you. And final word to Freddie, I think, who's got her hand up. Yeah, I, th I, uh, I just wanted to say that, yes, we can, uh, we can say in, in many parts of the world that, uh, and then we see in many parts of the world that if there is, there's fire weather conditions, then it will burn and there will be some, some ignition will, uh, will happen. Um, and that's not in all parts, not in all forests, but in many parts of the world, so we do see that. And there we can, we can say for, especially for the temperate forests um, and, and Mediterranean climates where we see also drying and an increase in temperature. We can see that, that also the, um, that, that the, the risk of fire weather does increase with climate change. And, um, and also I think what Frank was saying, that's important that the seasonality changes and that has a huge impact on, uh, on, on the, the, also the, the extent and intensity of the fires. Okay, um, well, sadly, that's our time up. And I just want to say a huge, huge thanks to our panelists in the first instance, and also to all the people who've been sending in these excellent questions. And also to my colleagues, Daisy, obviously, for chairing, chairing the discussion today. And also to um, my other colleagues, Rob McSweeney, who behind the scene has been helping with sort of um, going through these questions. And also the sort of technical whizzes, Rebecca Daniel and Joe Goodman, who've also been helping behind the scenes with the YouTube live stream. But just want to say big, big thanks to everyone. And this will be, this recording will now be placed on YouTube within a few minutes, I think. So again, many thanks and um, great discussion.